Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I'm Deborah Carnegie, and welcome to the Microsoft Research Speaker Series. I'm pleased to announce to, uh, introduce today's author, George Saunders. George Saunders has been described as one of the most important and original writers of his generation and an undisputed master of the short story. He started his career as a geophysicist, receiving his degree from the Colorado School of Mines and traveling the world doing site evaluation for oil drilling. In 1988, he received his MA in creative writing from Syracuse University. Since 1997, Saunders has been on the faculty of Syracuse University teaching creative writing in the school's MFA program, while continuing to publish highly acclaimed fiction and nonfiction. He is the author of several collections of short stories, including Past oh, Pastor. <laughs> Pastoralia and Civil War Land in Bad Decline, as well as a collection of essays and a book for children. In 2000, The New Yorker named him one of the best writers under 40. He writes regularly for The New Yorker and Harper's, as well as Esquire, GQ, and The New York Times Magazine. He won a National Magazine Award for Fiction in 2004, and his work is included in the Best American Short Stories 2005. In 2006, he was awarded both a MacArthur Fellowship and a Guggenheim Fellowship. The New York Times Magazine described his newest work, 10th of December, as the best book you'll read this year. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to George Saunders. Thank you very much. That, uh, the thing about that New York Times thing is we, we all have to promise not to read any other books this year, and then we'll be all good. Just swear off, swear off the Tolstoy, and we'll all, we can protect the unimpeachability of the Times. Um, it's really nice to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, I thought I would just keep it kind of informal and maybe do a little bit of a talk about, um, you know, the creative process as it manifests in fiction writing and then read you just a little example uh, and then we could just have some questions if, if you want to. Uh, are you on break from work? Is that, you're like, a, so, so we'll prolong, we'll, we'll prolong it. It'll be a six hour presentation followed by drinks. Um, no, so I, one of the things, um, I'm on a big tour now at this, this, um, New York Times thing kind of shot this book out of the can, and so I'm getting a kind of anthropological opportunity to see what actual attention is like. Um, and, uh, and it's pretty good. It's, no, it's, uh, it, but um, in the process, you know, you do a lot of uh, interviews. And one of the, uh, and I've kind of become aware that one of the, uh, the tropes of American uh, public intellectual life is uh, a version of what we call the intentional fallacy, which is that you know, the person who's making the artistic product uh, knew what he was doing at the beginning, had a very strong idea about it, shat it down upon the public, uh, and then walked away feeling very, very patriarchal and satisfied. And uh, in fact, for me, I, uh, the process is com the complete inversion of that, and I'm sure for many of you in your, in your work, uh, as a former scientist, I, I went to the School of Mines in Colorado and was trained as a field geophysicist. So, uh, you know, in science and in, in technology, we understand that you really, you really don't know until you get there. That, you know, that the devil's in the details. You have to have some kind of plan, but then the whole, uh, the, the sort of fire of the creative process is to get in there, realize you totally screwed up, uh, and then start adjusting uh, your, your, your assumptions. So in fiction, it turns out, um, at least in my experience of it, the, the way this happens is you have some kind of idea. In my case, I try to keep it as small as possible because I know myself, and when I get big and conceptual, I tend to uh, uh, stink up the joint. It's a technical term, stink up the joint. Uh, so, so what happens is I'll, I'll try to come up with what I think of as a seed crystal of an idea, just a tiniest little a bit of dialogue or sometimes a little conceptual situation, just enough to get a couple paragraphs. And then uh, at that point, if you're lucky, the text will start talking back to you and uh, correcting your, your misconceptions. So for example, in my case, a lot of times the, uh, well, and every, every time, the first draft is a little sloppy. Uh, it's not that funny. It's a little repetitive. The language has a kind of an everyman quality that I don't like. So then um, the form of problem solving is to go in and start tweaking individual sentences and phrases uh, mostly in my case uh, in terms of sound to try to make them sound better and in the process mysteriously and kind of wonderfully what happens is as you're cutting a sentence or phrase down there will appear a kind of uh, uh, a linking place suddenly you need a two-beat or three-beat phrase and it will be gorilla house 
And you're like, oh, I did not know there was a gorilla house in the story. But the, the sonics of the, of the sentence has just told me that there is. So you put the gorilla house in because it sounds good. And suddenly then you have a gorilla house to work with, which then implies gorillas and, you know, I don't know. So uh, it's, and in my case, what I do is a kind of an iterative process where I, I have one story in this book that I started in 98 and just finished last spring. And it's just going over and over and over uh, with a red pen in hand every day, just trying to make those small tweaks until very slowly the, um, the fictive reality starts to change. It's almost like a big cruise ship starts to move in the direction that your subconscious wants it to go. So it's not, it's sort of a, um, one of the challenges of this, of this touring has been to try to talk about that process in a way that isn't reductive, that doesn't discredit the actual uh, process because often the questions come in the form of, you write a lot about class. Did you mean to do that? You know, and you think, oh, yes and no, you know. Uh, so on this particular, I want to read you a little bit of a story that, that got put together just this way. Um, and the seed of it was, uh, when I, ever since I was a kid, I've had this feeling, um, and, and it was reinforced in engineering school, that a pretty good model for human intelligence is the machine. In a certain way, uh, depending on the state of the, of the neural matter, uh, we can be heroic or we can be jerks. Uh, and I remember having a high fever once as a kid and thinking, well, I'm a different person with a high fever. There's something, there's literally something, my thought processes are, are altered under this state of having a, a fever. Or then having a mad crush on somebody and you notice that the neurology is also different in that state. Uh, so this idea that character and personality and all these things are actually quite uh, mutable, uh, quite uh, situational. And so this, I just... Uh, decided to write this story kind of, I started with that idea, how would we maybe show that in prose? So, um, one of the, the shtick of this story is that there's, there's, we're a little more advanced than we are now in terms of being able to alter, pharmaceutically alter our, our perceptions. Uh, so I think you'll get the idea. This is just a little excerpt, the beginning uh, section of the story called Escape from Spiderhead. Drip on, Abnesti said over the PA. What's in it, I said. Hilarious, he said. Acknowledge, I said. Abnesti uses remote. My Mobipack trademark word. Soon, the interior garden looked really nice. Everything seemed super clear. I said out loud, as I was supposed to, what I was feeling. Garden looks nice, I said. Super clear. Abnesti said, uh, Jeff, how about we pep up those language centers? Sure, I said. Drip on, he said. Acknowledge, I said. He added some verba loose to the drip, and soon I was feeling the same things but saying them better. The garden still looked nice. It was like the bushes were so tight-seeming and the sun made everything stand out. It was like any moment you expected some Victorians to wander in with their cups of tea. It was as if the garden had become a sort of embodiment of the domestic dreams forever intrinsic to human consciousness. <laughs> it was as if, as if I could suddenly discern in this contemporary vignette the ancient corollary through which Plato and some of his contemporaries might have strolled. To wit, I was sensing the eternal and the ephemeral. I sat pleasantly engaged in these thoughts until the verbalus began to wane, at which, point the gar at which point the garden just looked nice again. It was something about the bushes and whatnot. It made you just want to lay out there and catch rays and think your happy thoughts, if you get what I mean. Then whatever else was in the drip wore off, and I didn't feel much about the garden one way or the other. My mouth was dry, though, and my gut had that post verbalus feeling to it. Uh, what's going to be cool about that one, Epnesti said, is say a guy has to stay up late guarding a perimeter. Or is at school waiting for his kid and gets bored, but there's some nature nearby. Or say a park ranger has to work a double shift. That will be cool, I said. That's ED763, he said. We're thinking of calling it Nature Glide, or maybe Earth Admirer. Those are both good, I said. Thanks for your help, Jeff, he said, which is what he always said. Only a million years to go, I said, which was what I, was what I always said. Then he said, exit the interior garden now, Jeff. Head over to small workroom two. Into small workroom two, they sent this pale, tall girl. What do you think? Abnesti said over the PA. Uh, me, I said, or, or her? Both, Abnesti said. Pretty good, I said. 
fine, you know, she said, normal. Amnesty asks us to rate each other more quantifiably as per pretty, as per sexy. It appeared we liked each other about average, i.e. no big attraction or revulsion either way. Abnessi said, uh, Jeff, drip on? Acknowledge, I said. Heather, drip on? He said. Acknowledge, Heather said. Then we looked at each other like, what happens next? What happened next was, Heather soon looked super good. And I could tell she thought the same of me. It came on so sudden we were like laughing. How could we not have seen it? How cute the other one was. Luckily, there was a couch in the workroom. It felt like our drip had, in addition to whatever they were testing, some ED556 in it, which lowers your shame level to like nil. <laughs> because soon, there on the couch, off we went. It was super hot between us, and, and not merely in a horn dog way. Hot, yes, but also just right. Like if you dreamed of a certain girl all your life, and all of a sudden there she was in your same workroom. Uh, Jeff, Abnessi said, I'd like your permission to pep up your language centers. Go for it, I said, under her now. Drip on, he said. Acknowledge, I said. Me too, Heather said. You got it, Abnessi said with a laugh. Drip on. Acknowledge, she said, all breathless. Soon, experiencing the benefits of the flowing verbal loose in our drips, we were not only fucking really well, but also talking pretty great. Like instead of just saying the sex type things we had been saying, such as wow and oh god and hell yes and so forth, we now began freestyling RER sensations and thoughts in elevated diction with 80% increased vocab, our well-articulated thoughts being recorded for later analysis. For me, the feeling was approximately astonishment at the dawning realization that this woman was being created in real time directly from my own mind per my deepest longings. Finally, after all these years, was my thought, I had found the precise arrangement of body, face, mind that personified all that was desirable. The taste of her mouth, the look of that halo of blondish hair spread out around her cherubic yet naughty looking face. She was beneath me now, legs way up. Even not to be crude or dishonor the exalted feelings I was experiencing, the sensations her vagina was producing along the length of my thrusting penis were precisely those I had always hungered for. Though I had never, before this instant, realized that I so ardently hungered for them. That is to say, a desire would arise, and concurrently, the satisfaction of that desire would also arise. It was as if, A, I longed for a certain heretofore untasted taste, until B, said longing became nearly unbearable, at which time C, I found a morsel of food with that exact taste already in my mouth, perfectly satisfying my longing. Every utterance, every adjustment of posture bespoke the same thing. We had known each other forever were soulmates, had met and loved in numerous preceding lifetimes, and would meet and love in many subsequent lifetimes, always with the same transcendently stupefying results. Then there came a hard to describe but very real drifting off into a number of sequential reveries that might best be described as a type of non-narrative mind scenery, i.e. a series of vague mental images of places I had never been, a certain pine-packed valley and high white mountains, a chalet-type house in a cul-de-sac, the yard of which was overgrown with wide, stunted, Susian trees, each of which triggered a deep sentimental longing, longings that coalesced into and were soon reduced to one central longing, i.e. an intense longing for Heather and Heather alone. This mind scenery phenomenon was strongest during our third bout of lovemaking. Apparently, Abnesti had included some vivistiff in my drip. Afterward, our protestations of love poured forth, simultaneously linguistically complex and metaphorically rich. I dare say we had become poets. We were allowed to lie there, limbs intermingled for nearly an hour. It was bliss. It was perfection. It was that impossible thing, happiness that does not wilt to reveal the thin shoots of some new desire rising from within it. We cuddled with a fierceness focus that rivaled the fierceness focus with which we had fucked. There was nothing less about cuddling vis-a-vis -vis fucking, is what I mean to say. We were all over each other in the super friendly way of puppies or spouses meeting for the first time after one of them has undergone a close brush with death. Everything seemed moist, permeable, sayable. Then something in the drip began to wane. I think Abnesti had shut off the verbal loose. Also the shame reducer. Basically everything began to dwindle. Suddenly we felt shy but still loving. We began the process of trying to tra talk apre verbalus, always awkward. Yet I could see in her eyes that she was still feeling love for me, 
and I was definitely still feeling love for her. Well, why not? We had just fucked three times. Why do you think they call it making love? That is what we had just made three times, love. Then Abnessi said, drip on. We'd kind of forgotten he was even there behind his one-way mirror. I said, did we have to? We're, we're really liking this right now. Uh, we're just going to try to get you guys back to baseline, he said. We've got more to do today. Shit, I said. Rats, she said. Drip on, he said. Acknowledge, we said. Soon something to begin, began to change. I mean, she was fine. The handsome, pale girl. But nothing special. And I could see that she felt the same re me, i.e., what had all that fuss been about just now? Why weren't we dressed? <laughs> we real quick got dressed. Kind of embarrassing. Did I love her? Did she love me? Ha, no. Then it was time for her to go. We shook hands. Out she went. Lunch came in on a tray, spaghetti with chicken chunks. Man, was I hungry. I spent all lunchtime thinking. It was weird. I had the memory of fucking Heather, the memory of having felt the things I'd felt for her, the memory of having said the things I'd said to her. My throat was like raw from how much I'd said and how fast I'd felt compelled to say it. But in terms of feelings, I basically had not a left. Just a hot face and some shame, Ari having fucked three times in front of Abnesti. After lunch, in came another girl. About equally so-so. Dark hair, average build, nothing special, just like upon first entry, Heather had been nothing special. This is Rachel, Abnessi said on the PA. This is Jeff. Hi, Rachel, I said. Hi, Jeff, she said. Drip on, Abnesti said. We acknowledged. Something felt very familiar about the way I now began feeling. Suddenly, Rachel looked super good. Abnesti requested permission to pep up our language centers uh, via verbalus. We acknowledged. Soon we too were fucking like bunnies. Soon we too were talking like articulate maniacs, R.E.R. love. Once again, certain sensations were arising to meet my concurrently arising desperate hunger for just those sensations. Soon my memory of the perfect taste of Heather's mouth was being overwritten by the current taste of Rachel's mouth. So much more the taste I now desired. I was feeling unprecedented emotions, even though those unprecedented emotions were, I discerned somewhere in my consciousness, exactly the same emotions I had felt earlier for that now unworthy seeming vessel, Heather. Rachel was, I mean to say, it. Her lithe waist, her voice, her hungry mouth, hands, loins, they were all it. I just loved Rachel so much. So I'll pause there and do what Reading Rainbow used to call leaving you hanging. Uh, <laughs> it goes on from there. Anyway, thanks. And uh, so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to talk informally about the sort of writing process or whatever you... It's a funny thing. I'm not, I do a lot of traveling. I notice that it's always the most sexually energetic person in the room who has the first question. It's kind of a weird... Uh, I think it's a Dar some kind of Darwinian thing. I don't know if that's... A, no, no, I, I knew it was you. I knew it was you. <laughs> yeah. no, it's, it's interesting, you're talking about the, your experience with the New York Times almost as if it was like sort of by surprise. You know? Yeah. And, and I'd, I'd love to hear more about that because from the outside, it seemed like, and I've admired your work for many years now, it kind of seemed like you were kind of having your turn in the Shabon, Franz, and David Foster Wallace kind of spotlight, you know? Right. And it struck me that you had a particularly astute and savvy publicist driving that process for you. But no, actually, I mean, I knew the interview was happening. Uh, they, that, that had been set up, and it was always sort of wobbly, like, well, we, you know, they're, they're, they're thinking about doing a story, but we're not sure, will you meet the reporter? And so we had four or five really great, he's a great guy, and we really had a, a nice bonding. But even, I guess, up until, you know, the last month, it was kind of like, it wasn't sure that it was going to happen. And then the headline itself was, you know, you don't know that. It just kind of gets dropped. So uh, I knew there would be an interview. And, you know, you feel that he was kindly disposed. to. to it wasn't like a, a gotcha kind of thing. You know, it was too small to be gotten, you know. But, uh, but it was more like, well, we're going to try to run this piece. It'll be kind of a, an attempt to get your work 
shared to more people. And then the headline kind of came at the last minute and was kind of a, I mean, in, in, in a way it's sort of cringe, you know, it's like if someone says, I've got the funniest joke I'm going to tell you right now, you are going to laugh your ass off so funny. Then, you, you know, everybody kind of braces. But now I kind of feel like it was maybe like a slightly hyperbolic, ornery throwdown by them. And it did what they wanted it to do, which is really kind of, you know, open the doors. So I'm happy for it. It, it is kind of, you know, it's a little funny to, uh, uh, you, you know, to say something's the best book you read all year in the second week of January is, is in, <laughs> in, inviting some backlash maybe, you know. But I had a funny, I had an a exchange with this writer. Um, and, you know, he said, oh, uh, congratulations on that piece. And I said, yeah, I emailed him just waiting for the backlash. And he wrote back like two seconds later, uh, uh, I liked your early work better, you know, <laughs> so, I, so, but I, I feel like it's, it's kind of a fun mid or late life ride just to kind of, you know, enjoy it and see what I think. Second most energetic, yeah. <laughs> um, so, do you mind, um, could you perhaps go into the, like, the sentences or, you know, the dialogue that, for that, that got that story going? Yeah. I, you know what, actually, the, there was that idea that I said, you know, about the, this, could we somehow in prose demonstrate the idea that uh, personality, i.e. character, is uh, malleable, and not only by event, but maybe by drugs. So that was one kind of conceptual idea. And then the other kind of thing that, that came in from the side and enlivened it was I had written, um, I don't remember, I'd written two or three stories before this where part of the shtick was um, I kind of purposely depressed the level of my level of expression kind of minimalist, kind of a little dumbed down, uh, just as a sort of a trope. And I was sort of tired of that. I wanted to try to write something that would be uh, me at my most articulate. But I couldn't quite figure out how to do that. So then when this idea of verbalus came in, that was sort of just a, a cute little trick to give yourself permission to do that. So those two things, those two ideas kind of collided on the same day a little bit. And it was just real, literally just kind of feeling that bit of resistance uh, writing that first part a little minimally and kind of maybe 20% dumber than me. Uh, and then almost like your body was like, ah, come on, I'm sick of this. And then it lurched into that higher register. And then you sort of go, well, why did it do that? And then within the story, there was a, there was a rationale. You know? So I've, I've often felt it, in, and I'm sure it's true in, in other art forms too, that part of what you have to really watch is your own discontent. You know, you're doing something and your body is starting to get restless with it or your, your, your mind or whatever. And that's often, you know, a pretty good barometer of what your reader might be feeling. So in that model, your um, writing is sort of a, a date, you know, you're on a date with somebody. And if you see her start looking off or nodding off or something, it, it's an indicator that you should change things a little bit. And on the other hand, you don't want to go on a date with a bunch of index cards, you know, 705, ask about her mother, good, got that, you know. So, so I, I mean, the model I have now for artistic interaction is that it's a very intimate uh, full body relationship and your job as the writer is to be really, really fresh uh, and alert to what your imagined reader might be feeling at that point, which of course is, is an impossible thing, it, it, that's, especially if you've read the piece 90 million times, but it's a pretty good working model. So part of my practice now is to try to get yesterday's preconceptions about the work wiped clean you know, as much as possible before you go in in the morning. So that, this one wasn't so much, I think not so much on the sentence level, but kind of on the general level of the, of the discourse. It takes a jump up when he's on that pill. Um, and, you know, so that, that made a lot of verbal fun, basically. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Sir. Um, along those lines, uh, I'm curious, how do you know when uh, a story is finished? You mentioned that one of your pieces took years in the making. Yeah. How do you, do you imagine the reader being fully satisfied with it? With that? Yeah, that's, that's the million dollar question. And I think, you know, I teach at Syracuse and that's one of the things that you realize every writer has a different answer to, you know. Uh, for me, it's kind of like, I, I sometimes think it's a bit like if you were, for some reason, painting the floor of a room, like maybe you were mentally insane, but you're, you're painting, painting the floor of a room uh, and you paint yourself out of the room. You know, you look and you, yeah, that's all pretty much all the same color blue, except that's a little too light. And then you get one foot left, you know. So it's kind of like late stage in a story, I'll, I'll be reading it and I won't have any objections. Or another way to say it, I sometimes imagine there's a, a gauge in your head with a needle, you know, positive is here, negative is here. And as you're reading, part of your job is to be self-aware and kind of watch where your imagined reader, what, what his reaction is. So you start off, yeah, pretty good, funny, nice. Okay, oh yeah, I like that, that's a good image, you know, whatever. You're, you're just 
responding positively. And at some point in the revision process, you get to something where you go, Arr. you know, and suddenly you're like, I don't know, I don't, uh, I'm not feeling it. So when you get there, that's where you start reworking it. And there's a really wonderful moment where you get to say, all right, what is it about that that's pissing you off? You know, you, you, page six has been a, a thorn in your side for two weeks. Really now, what is it? You know, uh, so then basically ending just means you get through the whole piece with the needle in the positive. Uh, and then, you know, it's almost like at that point you can go through it with pleasure and without much resistance. And then at some point you go, all right, that, that's it. So it's kind of a very visceral kind of a, a thing. Yeah. Yes, sir. How do you know what the limits of racy language are? Because you couldn't do this talk on commercial television, for example. No, you couldn't. Uh, <laughs> well, we could try, but no, I, uh, I don't, you know, but that story was in New Yorker. So I think I kind of assume in a world where, you know, with South Park and, you know, that, um, I mean, there, it's a little bit like that old George Carlin thing, the seven words you can't say on TV. So that's true, you can't. But in, in print, there aren't so many limitations. This, I, I don't think... I mean, not this. I mean, yeah. but, you know... How do you know when you're crossing the line? I, you know, it's the same thing. It's that, that there's a point where the needle will go, oh, you're just being naughty now. Come on. You know, you're, you're being, uh, uh, or often it's you're being naughty because you're insecure at this point. Does the publisher tell you that? No. Well, they would. I think they would. But by, by the time I send stuff out, I kind of know, you know, and it's sort of like, you know, using swear words in, in a piece. When you're young, you fucking use them every fucking time because it's fucking tough. You know, you, you get, you, it's, a, it's a defense mechanism. And then as you get older, you go, yeah, that's, you know. So, again, it's that meter thing where in this piece, you know, there was, the, there was all kinds of, I gave myself permission to write sexually, sexuality. Uh, so, in a certain way, you're always asking how, how important is this to my overall mission, you know. In, in what I'm trying to accomplish here aesthetically and morally, ethically, uh, Maybe what's the minimum I could get away with, you know? But it's a great, I mean, it's, it's a real balancing act. It's, the whole thing to me is a bit like riding a bike. You know, you, you're not really thinking, whoops, I'm leaning left. You're feeling it as you go through these revisions. And at some point you go, that's, that's just about the right mix, you know? You may have in the back. Oh, um, I, I love how we were um, stories criticizing part of society. Um, do you start with that in mind, or is that something that you end up with? What was the thing that society? Um, sort of like, no, I don't start. I mean, I have, and you know, there, there's a great uh, quote. Since we're talking about swearing, I can say it. But there's a great Gerald Stern was a poet, and he one time told a group, uh, if you start out to, to write a poem about two dogs fucking, and you write a poem about two dogs fucking, then you wrote a poem about two dogs fucking. So, so the idea, or Einstein said it in a higher way. Einstein said. Um, uh, no, no worthy problem is ever solved in the plane of its original conception. Einstein is kind of a show-off. You know, but, 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 but seriously, I think in art, you know, uh, oftentimes, and I see this with my students, we go into it for lofty reasons, uh, moral reasons, political reasons, but if that is, uh, gets into the actual work, that's sort of a condescending thing to do. You know, I know where I stand on issue X, reader, sit there and receive. That's actually anti-art. So I have all kinds of very vital political views and so on, but whenever I see one coming in, I kind of try to warn it back. Now, they get in there anyway. They, they do. But I think um, if you can recognize that your main job, as I said, is to be in intimate relationship with the reader. An intimate relationship doesn't mean preaching. You know? It doesn't, doesn't in include preaching. It doesn't include the moment where you're sure and you're just bonking the reader on the head. Uh, so I think that's one of the real challenges. If you have a passionate moral feelings about the world, seems like fiction or poetry would be a nice you know, way to express them, but actually I think they have to be held back in order for anything to happen at all. Yes, sir. That, that uh, sense of an ideal reader out there is a, that, that you have available in your head is a really precious thing. How do you, are you just lucky in the, that your idiosyncratic fantasy of that is apparently commercially successful? <laughs> yeah. or, or do you do research? Do you take feedback? Or do you have corrections to your assumptions. Well, I have a wife, and that's, no, 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 seriously, she, and she, we were in grad school together, and she's a great reader, so, so she is the first reader, and after I've worked on it for many, sometimes years, I'll give it to her, and basically, if she reacts emotionally, strong, you know, strongly, then I know I'm good, but before that, I think, I think it's, it's, you're right, it's a completely weird, specious, kind of strange thing to construct an imaginary reader, but I, I think the working model is, is you if you hadn't already read the thing 9,000 times, if you came to it fresh on the bus and picked it up 
you know, so in a certain way, the whole process of learning to be a writer is constructing that imaginary consciousness that is spurious. Um, but I think that, that, I think it can be done, you know. And the pro of course, uh, the other thing is the iterative approach is a kind of an insurance policy because if you're reading a piece 6,000 times, each time trying to be open to it, you know, you're going to manifest uh, as all the different people that you are and there's almost like a statistical thing that will happen where when you're in a terrible mood and you hate yourself, you want to tear the thing up, well, okay, ignore that guy for a while. And then over the, over the 6,000 readings, it'll kind of, it kind of becomes its best self, and I think you know, that reader you can kind of trust. So it, kind of iffy, but, <laughs> yeah. but my wife, it, it, it's her in the background. Uh, I was struck in that New York Times piece about your time at Radium, mm -hmm. uh, and, and as I read into it, I mean, it seemed like a very unartistic place, right, this technical writing, and, but, and I don't know if you feel the same way, but I took away from the New York Times sort of, that seemed really critical to your development and who you are and your voice and really your eventual success. I'm not sure if I exactly have a question, but I'm just curious no, your reaction. You're exactly, that's exactly the right, that's true. Because I, I had been, uh, you know, like a lot of young writers, I, I thought, well, I'll be, I'll fight, I'll be a bullfighter. That would be a good thing, you know, or I'll, or I'll be on a fishing boat or I'll, you know, anything that was adventurous I, I could get. And my class origins were sort of work. I, I worked since I was 16. And so when I got out of grad school and we got married <coughs> and I ended up working at that place, I thought it was kind of a defeat. Like, shit, how can I be an artist when I'm in this terrible place, you know? And it turned out to be an incredible blessing because, of course, you know, life is everywhere, which means literature is everywhere. And the only thing that wasn't getting it was my own kind of uh, stupid sensibility that said in order for it to be art, it's got to be exotic, uh, it's got to be other. So it was a seven or eight year tech writing job there and during which I wrote my first book. And it was an incredible blessing because, uh, you know, if, if you can't go to literature, literature will come to you. And in that place, uh, I heard so much incredible language, you know, uh, corporate language. And if, if my first reaction was aversion, that's not language. But then, of course, that, it's all language. And, and so I came to think that poetry uh, is actually any diction, no matter how weird, that you can overflow. So in that place, you would hear a lot of people who had been trained in that kind of stiff, passive voice corporate thing, and then were having an affair, for example. You know, So it's like, Molly, in terms of my feelings for you, there are things which are not at this time appropriate to express in this environment. But he's red in the face, you know, <laughs> and, and you think, wow, you're, he's in, that's a love poem, you know. It, so, so it was a real breakthrough, a, a blessing to be in there day after day and not as an outsider, not as a reporter. Uh, we were doing a lot of work with uh, environmental companies who had done environmental pollution and we were sort of their mouthpiece and also doing, you know, legitimate geological studies. And so it was just a great immersion in, well, for one thing, okay, I was in that generation who, that couldn't pronounce the word corporation without a sneer, you know, the corporation, you know. And then to be in there and go, wait a minute, this, this, this is great. You know, I mean, we have health insurance. We have these two little babies at home. It was very familial in that office. So it was a great lesson in, in uh, kind of disturbing your ambient conceptions. And that made it into that first book for sure. So that was a major, major turning point, yeah. Did you, sir? Yeah, uh, your, your uh, inner critic is, is really well developed, I think. And yeah. I'm wondering if, you're, if you've ever gotten any feedback from anyone in the press that has, that has made you rethink any of your work. Constantly, yeah. I, I, uh, I was talking before, I got the chance to go on a trip with Clinton a few years ago, and I interviewed him, and I said, what do you, what do, you do with, all that, with all the hate? Because he gets a lot of, a lot. And he said that Hillary had given me advice that, and he didn't put it this way, but I'll, I'll, he said that basically it comes to you in a, and he didn't say that, in a shit matrix. You know, it, can't, it comes to you sometimes in, from a, a source that doesn't like you in a very aggressive, negative way. But Hillary told him if there's some gold in there and you don't take it, then the joke's on you. you know? So I, I have had a lot of reviews that at first were like, oh, God, that's embarrassing. I hope nobody reads that. It hurts. No, you, you're, you're wrong. And then a couple weeks later, you go, you know what? There was something in there that was really... One guy, one guy, I don't remember the review, but I remember not liking it at all, being hurt by it. But in there, he said, Saunders is a writer who works better out of love than anger. And that was really true, you know, and I'd never thought of it. So I think, you know, it's like anything else, you, your defenses come up, but then if you can just make a mental note to not disregard the, the good stuff, it's very powerful. Thanks. Sir, how about you? So when you have a day job like that, how do you find the energy to 
<laughs> do your heart. Yeah. That's the. Yeah. Well, one, I, you can tell I have a high metabolism. That was one thing. I, so I would get home and have a pot of coffee and work at night sometimes. But also in that job, I don't know how it is here at Microsoft, but there um, we build our hours. So, you, so, for example, if somebody offended me uh, and then they gave me two hours of billable time for what I knew to be a 40 minute job, I would just go, well, I'll, I'll try to get it done. And then that extra hour and 20 minutes was writing time, you know. And at, and at that point, at that point, this was way back when, and we were, I was, um, this was in the 90s, so uh, I was known, I had a reputation as the guy who could do the covers for the documents because I, I could center and change fonts. And kind of, you know, I'm not bragging, but uh, <laughs> so, so they would say, well, can you do a cover for, well, I'll try to fit you in. And then you take an hour for it, and it's, you know, it's 20 seconds. So uh, it was a lot of, a lot. and you know, actually, I'll tell you something that helped me a lot. When I was younger, I'd come back from Asia, and I was really kind of like scraping bottom, living with my aunt in Chicago. And I had this Hemingway-esque idea that I'd go to El Salvador. That was my thing, and I, I don't report it. Didn't speak Spanish, you know, but this was my dream. So I went to, uh, I was going to see a friend of mine, and he wasn't home, but his dad was there. And his dad was kind of a classic Southside Chicago Irish truck driver, uh, raised, you know, 19, 20 kids, whatever. And... Uh, and I was talking to him. I said, you know, I'm thinking about, I want to be a writer and I think I'm maybe going to El Salvador. And I kind of expected him to mock me, right? But he said, uh, he said, no, you know what? If that's your dream, you got to do it. I said, yeah. He said, because you know why? If you don't do it, you know who you're going to blame, right? I said, yeah, myself. He said, bullshit. You'll blame your wife and your kids. And I thought, yeah, that's right. And so I remembered that when I was working that job. And I would feel a little guilty and I think, you know, if I don't tr at least try this uh, in another five or six years, I'm going to be a miserable guy. And so then you, once you give yourself permission to steal time, it's kind of a, enjoyable. You know, it's kind of... <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> sir. It is, but, um, you turned the phrase giving yourself permission. You used it before. I gave myself per permission to write about sex. Yeah. And I'm wondering what that, per what that permission entailed. I mean, do you yeah. need to give yourself permission to write about forests, for example? Oh, huh. well. Wow. Ah, that's a great question. I'll, I'll have the answer about 4 a.m. Okay, you know, but, no, I mean, I, I, you know, part of it is, I think, um, okay, I, the way I understand the story form is that it's very strict, actually. It, it doesn't, um, if you're doing something, well, I had a Hollywood guy one time say it very beautifully. He said that in a script, uh, everything you write has to do two things. It has to uh, advance the plot in a non-trivial way and be beautiful in its own right. So the story is, is very, that's, that's the, the motto of the story. So I think the permission sometimes means, okay, um, we, strict formal, uh, strict form requires a scene here that it has sex in it. And that's the permission. Be, because the form has given permission to do it. Whereas just to say, yeah, I think I'll write some sex, that, that somehow is against the discipline in a certain way. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's... So yeah. we're getting integral. Yes. Got yeah, and, and if, you, after you've been writing stories for a long time, you, you kind of know when something is essential and what, when it isn't, and when you're being self-indulgent and so on. Sure. Yeah. Great you. question. Yeah. Sir. Um, I was wondering about your, your output. Do you, do you stay with a story until it's a finished product, or are there things that just don't go anywhere and you put yeah. them aside? L lately, the, most stuff gets used, but sometimes way down the line. So I, what I do is I, have, I, I end up finishing two stories a year no matter what. If I'm on leave... If I'm, you know, it doesn't matter, two stories a year. So usually there's four or five kind of in, in process. And then the only kind of rule I have is that when I go in in the morning, I just scan the five and go, which one of you sons of bitches is going to be fun? You know, like if don't, I don't want to say, uh, I've had this one six years, I should get it done. But rather, which one of these seems uh, open in, in a certain way? And then sometimes one will lurch forward and continue to be enjoyable and you can feel your you can feel it heading towards the door, and then you might put everything aside and, and go. But for me, it's always useful to not have that um, terrifying blank page moment where there's no, you know. So like in this story that I just read, uh, there was a scene. I, I got on this comic riff where uh, one of the drugs they gave him was called Nightlife, K-N-I-G-H-T-L-Y-F-E, and it made you talk like a Renaissance Fair person. <laughs> and, uh, and it was really fun to write, and, and it wasn't essential. It didn't, it didn't do anything, in the, so I knocked it off and kept it for a couple of years, and then actually grew into another story in the book. So for me, the, the nightmare is that day when you go, wow, what should I write about? And if, you, if I just keep five things going on, then you never get to that day. You're always, you know, because you're not so much thinking, what am I going to write about, but what, here's this, what should I do with it? 
And then that question is easily answered just by starting to read it. You know, and you look for your little meter and see. So in that way, you never have that kind of where do you get your ideas moment, which to me is a, a terribly angst-filled you know, thing. You, mm. Are you seeing any trends or changes in literary fiction, creative fiction, um, given sort of the inundation of um, media and, and our shortness of attention spans? Or are you seeing that, you know, the form is going to um, uh, prevail over time? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. I, 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 I should know because I'm ideally situated to know it, but it's kind of hard to tell. I know, one thing I know for sure is, uh, you know, I teach at Syracuse, and we, when I go home, there's 560 applications for six spots in our program. Uh, so everywhere I go, there are so many incredibly talented young people who really are kind of living and dying by literature. So that makes me think we're fine no matter what. Uh, probably, honestly, I see a little bit of a decay in sort of stylistic engagement. Uh, the, the, if you could generalize, the, the, uh, the prose is a little more pedestrian than it was 10 or 15 years, but that's okay. You know, maybe it's just a, a formal thing. So I'm not sure. I know, I think that with the quality of TV, for example, right now, it's having sort of an effect like when, you know, when photography appeared, suddenly painting had to rethink itself a little bit. So I think a lot of, uh, my guess is that it will make fiction do what it does even better. And I think what it does is the kind of really complicated language things that makes that unity of writer, reader, character. You know, like if, if you're saying, uh, you know, uh, the woman stood by the ocean. Well, as soon as you write that, you have just supplied a woman in an ocean. And she's wearing a particular dress even, turns out, or, or not, we don't know. But, but there's something instantly triangulating about just a simple English sentence that makes the reader and the writer intimate, you know, in a way that I, I would argue that visual media does something else, also great, but not that. So I think that's what's going to happen is fiction is going to be maybe moved back into stylistic richness because that's kind of what we have to offer. I don't know. Kind of a, it's kind of my USA Today answer. We're eating more pigeons. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm curious whether you feel like you've found your form in the short story or whether you have desire or ambition to work in other areas, whether it's well, it's a novel, I don't want to, I hesitate to say novel because it's like they usually so privileged about short stories, yeah, yeah. But, but screenplays or... or you know. I have written, I had a period uh, after my third book of stories where I kind of felt a little bit artistically, not lost exactly, but non-energetic. So I wrote some nonfiction and some scripts and all that. And then I kind of came back with a vengeance to the story. So I think my, my baseline is I'm always writing a story. If someday one of them looked at me and said, I need another 80 pages, that would be great. But um, I always love that Flannery O'Connor quote. She says, uh, a, a writer can choose what he writes, but he can't choose what he makes live. So I think that's what, you know, you go into a piece and, and uh, it's always communicating with you. It's kind of telling you, cut me. I'm going on too long. Help, save me from myself. Or I'm sure in some cases it says, oh, now we need another 40 pages from a different point of view. So I think the first responsibility is just listen to what the text is saying to you without too many preconceptions, oh, I should write a novel, I always write stories, just kind of put that aside, you know. Because the number one responsibility is to, is to do something vital. And if you fail in that, then everything else fails too, you know. Thanks. Sir. Can, can you talk a little bit about uh, maybe some of your influences? Obviously, you've got a great essay about Vonnegut and sort of your discovery of Vonnegut. And it's funny because there's the technical writing correlation with Pynchon. You can see some parallels there. Like, who, who are you passionate about from a... Well, I came to writing kind of... Uh, a little bit late and from an, a weird angle. So, if, if you know, it's funny because the influence question, everyone, your first impulse is, well, Jesus was big for me, and Mother Teresa, I love her, and, you know, and, and uh, Shakespeare, and I, you know. But, in honestly, one of the things that I, uh, I made a kind of pivot. I, when I was at Radiant Corporation, I had not published in about seven years, and I made this two or three day kind of like Satori thing where suddenly I was getting published. And what happened was I remembered some actual influence that I had been denying, which were Steve Martin, Monty Python, uh, Rich Little, you know, all those kind of comedians. Uh, I, I think I had that early adolescent deep engorgement in those guys and loved them. Uh, oh, Gilda Radner, you know. And somehow, because of my, uh, my background, I think I thought, well, art was the thing that you can't do, the thing that's so difficult 
that you, you know it has nothing to do with who you are as a person it's some rare thing so all those comic influences I just said well you guys are nice but please don't come in with me this is fancy you know you can't you can't come into the dining hall and then in a moment of desperation which was being at that job for seven years and not having written anything that was good uh, I just went oh, all right and then you know I, I it was completely natural I, I had no I just had fun, and, I, and when I was in a story, I knew what to do, and it was, so that was kind of one of those moments where your real influences are the ones, maybe sometimes that are just so organic, it's like, you know, one of my big influences is oxygen, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, so that was really, you know, I, you know. Not to be a question hog, but like, who, who, are you, who are your literary heroes then, maybe it's a different way to say Well, it. I, I love Gogol, the Russian writer Gogol. I go back and read The Overcoat three or four times a year. Uh, and then more contemporary, Tobias Wolff was my teacher at Syracuse. And he's an incredible, I don't know if you know, incredible master. And also, he, he, I met him at a time in my life where I thought you had to be a derelict to be a writer. And he is so not a derelict. I mean, he's a former Green Beret, great family man. So that was a big, you know, kind of that, that coincidence of aesthetic and personal where you went oh okay so if you want to write these beautiful stories like Toby writes it has nothing to do with what you're doing out the other 20 hours of the day it has to do with those four we can't really know what he's doing but from the evidence he's bringing incredible ferocity and passion to this four hours and then he's going out and being a nice guy you know so that was a very permission giving in that sense because you, you didn't have, I didn't have to become addicted or you know, be, become like a crazy person. You could just do. Uh, the other guy that I love is Stuart Dybeck, if you're, if you're from Chicago. He's a great Chicago writer. And uh, I read this story, Hot Ice of his, which was kind of a, kind of set approximately in my dad's neighborhood in Chicago. So it was kind of the first time I'd read something that was, um, for which the real life corollary was available. And suddenly, went, oh, so literature isn't a, it isn't a mirror necessarily. It's, or at least it's not a flat mirror. It can be a distortive mirror. Uh, and then the other big influence was this Russian Isaac Babel, B-A-B-E-L, who even Hemingway said was uh, a, a much more efficient writer even than he, Hemingway was. And uh, he died at, uh, in a Stalinist camp at 40, but he has these beautiful stories that I think for American writers are important because they're very minimal and fast, but they're also funny. And a lot of them, he has a whole cycle set in childhood. So writers like me who loved Hemingway and thought, well, Hemingway equals exotica, uh, Babel is every bit as aesthetically intense, and it's set in a home, you know, a, sort of a suburban home, basically. So it's kind of a, a window. Yeah. Similarly, who are some of the new and emerging writers that you're most excited about right now? I love uh, this guy Ben Marcus. Do you read, have you read him? He's got a his latest book is called The Flame Alphabet, and he's got a for anybody who's technical, he's got a great book called The Age of Wire and String, which is this crazy book that's like a how-to guide for a universe that doesn't exist. Like one of the stories is called. Uh, resuscitation with vacuum cleaner of dead wife or something like that. And they're just these kind of Gertrude Steinian little prose poems that are kind of explosive. Um, one of my former students, Adam Levin, is really wonderful. He had that book called The Instructions. Uh, who else? Um, I think Sam Lipside is pretty amazing. Uh, that, Gary Lutz is a guy who's, they, they call him the, the, the best sentence writer in America, and I think that's probably, probably true. Lydia Davis, I think, is... Uh, I'm wonderful. Who do you, who do you like? Anybody? I'm... Um, I'll get back to you on that. You, you, you could just say me, and that would be then everybody's everybody's happy. <laughs> anyway, uh, yes, sir. So, um, could you talk a little bit about guess, your characters and humor? Because one of the things that strikes me in your reading, at least from my perspective, is that is often you'll set up situations or set up characters that it seems like it would be easy to tear them down or tear them apart in a funny way, but you often choose to go in the direction kind of humanity and art and trying to be funny in that space. Right. That's a, thank you. I, I, it's kind of the same thing that we talked about earlier where I'll often in a first draft I'm doing just what I'm tearing somebody down, you know. Uh, I had a story called The Barber's Unhappiness, which is, we lived in this little town in New York, and there was this barber who was there and I uh, was taking the bus so I had a lot of time to observe this guy and he was one of these guys who would always check out women kind of blatantly you know and even when they busted him he just you know and I, and I, and I just had our, our, we just had our daughter so I was like, like a new feminist you know and I like fuck why did, and once you notice it, it was even worse you know so I thought I'll, I'll write a story about that asshole you know and so I wrote the this story in which I just tore him down and it was really fun because you got to be kind of a you know, you sort of access your inner pervert and, you know, kind of think of how, how does the world look to him. And then about halfway into it, it just stopped dead, you know. 
and it was because I was having too much fun kicking them, you know. And so I think the story, it exists uh, formally, it exists in an area where there has to be some hope. You know, like if you wrote a story about a uh, completely irredeemable person, I don't think you could make it be a story, you know. So I had done that. I was, hey, this guy was so terrible and awful that you just hated him. Laughed at him, but hated him. And so I got stuck. And then finally when I realized, wait a minute, you have to have some, there's got to be some redeeming quality in him. And, and for me, the magic of fiction is that when you get to that point, you often find that you are on autopilot a little bit. You know, you're not actually looking at him as you've made him in language. You're kind of still operating on your first assumption. So when you go back and say, wait a minute now, let me think about this guy a minute. How, how is he really thinking? And in that story, because I'm not very subtle, I had put in a clue. I put in a quick, just a, a little throwaway joke that he had been born with no toes on one of his feet. It was just, a, 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 again, to make his sentence sort of funny. And then about a, a year into it, I went, oh, wait a minute, that's right, his left foot has no toes on it. Duh. And that was sort of a gateway into feeling more deeply about him and starting to actually kind of like him a little bit. So it, I guess the, the short answer is it's part of this iterative thing that first, yeah, you're going to kick the guy. Oh, isn't it funny? What a dope, you know? And the reader and the writer are standing over here mocking this guy in the schoolyard. And then you find out that that's not a story. That's maybe it's a satire piece or just mean. So then in revision, you start saying to the reader, wait here a minute, I'm going to go, this. I want to ask him something, you know, and go over. And then as you do that, he suddenly becomes, one, more interesting, and two, trickily, he's manifesting out of you, out of your shit, because where else could he come from? So suddenly then you like him better, <laughs> you know, so, so <laughs> if there's anything, you know, sort of redemptive about writing, it's that you, it, it, it trains you to be more caring, I think, or at least more attentive to, to other people in a certain way. It kind of seems like that dovetails a little with what you're saying before about if you're just using, I struggle with this too, if you're using the writing to just kind of preach your perspective, like your perspective on that guy was just that one thing. And exactly. it's like that isn't, art is not for me to preach politically, it's to sort of examine an issue. And this this almost became, it sounds like an examination of the character and maybe by, I mean, I don't, that guy probably didn't actually have no toes on his foot, but right. like an examination of the kind of mental process. No, exactly right. Kind of you're always examining your own processes, aren't you? Because yeah. for me to imagine a pervert well, wait a minute now. Let's slow down. You know, is that all he is? And, and although I, I and, and you're exactly right. And by the end, he was a guy who was doing that kind of behavior for a set of reasons that had to do with his own inferiority and so on. So, you know, but, but funny P.S. is the, that story came out in the New Yorker and we had moved by that time. And we went back to that town to visit some friends and we just happened to be walking by his shop the day the story came out. And uh, my wife, who's very pretty, and our daughters are there, and, uh, and they're very pretty but very young, you know, so we're walking by. And uh, he comes out, and I thought, you know what? What an asshole a fiction writer is. Here's this guy. He doesn't even know he's in The New Yorker. You just totally, what a jerk you are, George. You know, it's very arrogant. And as we pass, he turns, and he looks at my family, and he goes, ladies? Just like, I thought, but well, I, maybe I was, you know, more correct than I thought. But, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. Sorry, no, no, it's, just, it's, it's easier to have him as just that one thing sure. that's right. than to let yourself go, well, let me look into why he's that exactly. way. It's and, a lot more tempting. And what's mysterious, and I don't really understand this, and, and I think other writers get this, but somehow the form doesn't permit it. Now, I mean, of course it does. There, there are all kinds of stories that are basically propaganda and are, you know, uh, but, but if you're a, a well-trained reader, you won't stand for it. You won't stand for that kind of easy assassination. It's a very, very interesting thing. And there, there's a relation to uh, rewriting and a relation to your own discomfort in the face of a too easy truth, maybe, something like that. But, yeah, that's interesting. Um, between technical writing and, and the, the place you are now, um, how, was, how does the transition between technical and creative writing or how, how did you handle it? For example, when you do technical writing, you have to be in a particular mindset. Yeah. And when you're, when you're writing more creatively, there's, there's a shift. And there's, you have to open up certain things right. uh, in, inside of yourself for that to flow. Um, how would you rate yourself in your ability to do technical writing and have that go smoothly versus doing more <coughs> creative type? What's that experience like? Yeah, well, you know, the funny thing was I, when I was doing it, uh, writing my first book, it would literally be a two-second window, you know, where you, I'd have a report up and then realize that everyone had left the area, you know. And in those days, it was Shift F3, you know. So, so 
and then and so that was actually interesting because it sort of meant that you didn't have any time to conceptualize that shift. You just did it or you lost your writing time for the day. And I think that was, I, I haven't really thought about this, but I think it might have been valuable. Because at that point, my, my aesthetic thinking was sort of lame. And when I was in grad school, I did a lot of research, you know, like, oh, I think I'll do a research on, you know, uh, 15th century tendencies in Dutch, you know, whatever. In that office environment, there was none of that. And so you were just literally going from a report on codec, shift F3, looking at the new text. And I think that uh, enabled some originality in a certain way because, for example, the, the technical text, you know, as you know, nobody wants a lot of ornamentation, you know, in a manual. They want, you know. Uh, and so when I made the shift, some of that was, was there, you know, like I'd get, be writing a section of, you know, creative work, but still the principle of efficiency was very strong in my mind at the time. So I think that was actually kind of valuable. So for me, the thing was it just, the, 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 the speed meant that you couldn't theorize it. You just did it, you know. And then you sort of went, well, I, you know, I don't know if it's helpful or not, but I don't have a whole lot of choice. Because I think, I think one of the, things, the mistakes that I see in my students, that you, they sometimes have, as, as they get more time, they become more leisurely, which means you build up more neuroses about the actual doing, you know. Uh, so for me, it was incredibly helpful to have a situation where, you know, I was over 30, the clock was ticking, we had two daughters, and it was either right then between 2.14 and 2.20 or not at all that day. And it, it really, it's that, that thing about, you know, the knowledge that one is to be hanged in the morning has the effect of focusing the mind or something like that. And I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Well, that, that totally makes sense. So you time boxed yourself essentially yes. into, into actually producing something, getting something out the door because there was, there was a need for it. <clears throat> and then, so how much of that do you apply in your creative brain? I still do it, actually. I mean, I'm not working, you know, that kind of job, but I still do. I, I, I mimic that now. You know, I'll, I'll go in and uh, partly mimic the mindset and also just set, you know, I'll, I'll agree to do some chore in two hours. And, you know, so because I think because one of the things that, that it's amazing is, uh, you know, OK, speaking of that intentional fallacy, I think many of us who have artistic aspirations, we think the job is to know in advance what it is and then do it. And for me, a more kind of viable model is that art is this sort of black enclosure, black box. You really don't know what's going to happen in there, and you don't have to be responsible for it. You just have to make sure it's non-trivial, maybe, or whatever word works for you. But that frees you of the idea of how you should feel when you're doing it, how you should feel after you're doing it, having intentions while you're doing it. All that gets kind of set aside, and your job is to take the reader into that black box run around the other side, have her come out like, fuck, that was, wow, I don't even know what to say about that. You know, that's actually the whole, the whole job. And I think because it's such a scary job, we freight it with a lot of concepts. But, but in fact, you know, it, that's really the whole, the whole shebang. That's you know? where iteration I think, exactly. I, I always think iteration is a bit like if I, if I said, uh, I'm going to give you, I, I just gave you a furnished apartment in New York. I furnished it for you. Hope you like it. You know, you'd go in and you'd go, yeah. It's like the friggin' Holiday Inn. It doesn't feel like me. But if I said to you, okay, uh, every day you can take out one item and put in one that you, of your choosing. Well, then let two years go by. By then, every single thing in there has been touched by your preference. And it's more like you than you could even imagine it at a certain point. So I think revision is kind of like that. The thing slowly moves towards something you couldn't have predicted that inexplicably is more like you than you are, actually. You know, yeah. Yes, thank you. So you said that um, when you were writing your book, you were in your early 30s? Yeah. yeah. And you also said that you, were, you came to writing sort of somewhat late in life, mm -hmm. which early 30s is for many of us in the room. Oh, no, in the rear view. Yeah. Um, so, you, and isn't it good that it is? Who needs it? <laughs> um, you know, and not that it can't be done, but do you have any words of encouragement or advice to late bloomers in the world of writing and writing your own work? I, I think in art, it's, there is no such thing. It's just, I mean, you know, you, what, we, what you want is that, that flash of human realness, you know, and as we know, that it's not, it doesn't come uncalled, you know. Uh, and, and actually, from the other side of it, what I see at Syracuse is one of the biggest problems is, especially in today's MFA culture, is that kids are so in a hurry to get there while they're young, and they have all the chops and they have all the time, but they haven't been hurt. You know, they, ha they haven't, not hurt might be too strong, but they haven't, uh, they have nothing uh, to which they can subjugate their virtuosity. 
You know, so I, those of us who are older, you go in the world and you find out this stuff costs, you know. There are things that really are painful. There are things that are worth doing that are different. All those kind of things. And I think that is the gold, you know, to have been bruised maybe in your life, uh, to have your empathy expanded by something that happened to you or somebody you love, which seems to roughly correlate with age, you know, maybe roughly. That's gold. And I think, so yeah, so I don't think there's any, you know, if somebody, if I always thought when I was working that radiant job, it looked like it, things weren't going to happen, you know, and I thought, all right. And I thought, if, you know, if I could just write one good story by the time I'm 90, that good story lasts. You know, you, you go and look at a story like Indian Camp by Hemingway. I don't know how old he was when he wrote that or where he was, or any, but that story is, sort of exists out of time. So I think what I would say to, an, to a person who's, you know, young, but, but, but is, is uh, trust that whatever, you know, your life has made in you is exportable and is really valuable. And don't worry about time because that's just a buzzkill, you know, I think. One more question, anybody? I noticed in this latest collection that there is no introduction by you or the uh, preface is any of the stories that by choice. Yeah, I never do that. I, I, I really think that the stories should kind of speak on their own. And um, yeah, that, that the stories individually and then collectively should say whatever, not what I meant to say, but should say something. And uh, yeah, it's, I think it's not, in short story collections, it's sort of a little bit unusual to have an introduction. So the idea is just you're going to hit it running and it's going to do something to you and when you're done you'll know what it is. <laughs> something like that. Right. Thank you so much for your attention. Really enjoyed it. Do, do, do. Okay. Okay.